And now, it's time for the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show with Snowden Bishop. Listen in as Snowden interviews cannabis industry pioneers, marijuana experts, policymakers, medical practitioners, patients, and other amazing individuals with compelling stories to share. It all happens right now. Here's the Cannabis Reporter, Snowden Bishop. Hi, and welcome back to the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show. I'm Snowden Bishop, and I'm happy you've joined us today. If you've ever started a business, you know just how time-consuming and exhausting it can be just to set it up. Before you can sell anything, you have to raise funds, apply for a business license, establish bank accounts, find a location, hire the staff, and that's just a few of the tasks. Then once you open your doors, you have to find customers. And under the best of circumstances, it takes time to turn a profit, which can seem endlessly frustrating. Having been there and done that myself, I can attest to the fact that starting a business is no picnic, even when everything goes as planned. But ask a seasoned entrepreneur about the challenges they encounter starting a company in the cannabis space, and you'll be convinced that conventional businesses are a walk in the park by comparison. With every step, there are regulatory obstacles and legal barriers and political pitfalls that just don't exist in other sectors. Banks, insurance companies, and other federally regulated institutions are barred from catering to the cannabis industry, so entrepreneurs are basically left to fend for themselves. But many of the same entrepreneurs will tell you that the rewards of contributing to such a transformational industry make those everyday challenges seem well worth the risk. But be forewarned that Darwin's theory of survival of the fittest applies here. Not everyone has the high level of stamina, persistence, and unwavering passion required to overcome the immense challenges. But those who do are rewarded with a foot in the door of a billion dollar industry that's already transforming human health and paving the road toward a prosperous, sustainable future. But navigating the cannabis industry amid these legal ambiguities and regulatory constraints requires experience and knowledge. Fortunately, I have the expert here to shine the headlights on our road ahead. Mark Denzen, he's a leading expert in regulatory compliance, capital funding, and blockchain resources serving the cannabis industry. And with more than two decades of experience in mergers and acquisitions in the technology sector, he's held leadership positions for technology giants such as GoDaddy.com, Endurance International, and Network Business Services. Mark and his team have created a proprietary blockchain utility token called In-State Compliance Commodity Exchange, which provides the cannabis sector with banking and B2B transactions that are AML compliant. Mark, I'm so looking forward to this interview because if there's anyone who can help us understand the complexities of the regulatory landscape in the cannabis industry, it would be you. So I really appreciate your being here today. And with your extraordinary level of experience in the technology space, I'm really curious about the reasons you decided to apply your knowledge to the cannabis industry. And I think maybe it's best to start out by asking what are your goals for the industry or personally for your companies? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate being on the show. And uh, our, you know, our personal goal is to help an underserved market and really legitimize a legal business, meaning the cannabis business. And, and that means by uh, giving access to financial services that everyday traditional businesses have, like banking, business banking and business lending and, and credit card processing. Those are things that are or have been due to regulatory concerns have been very difficult to achieve. And so a lot of folks are using workarounds. So our goal really is to stop using the workarounds and follow the guidelines that the uh, U.S. federal government has set forth for for this industry to follow and be compliant. So that's really, you know, our ultimate goal here is to help legalize, legitimize a legal business. Right. It's been exceedingly frustrating for so many people for so long because no other emerging industry has ever had to deal with this kind of a complicated banking mechanism. It's really all due to the 80-year-long prohibition. When we started, there really wasn't much access. So what changed recently that enabled you to be able to provide these services? Yeah, it's very, very difficult. You know, the, the marijuana retail business is considered one of the highest risk spaces in retail. You know, with this designation comes higher compliance requirements, as outlined by the Cole Memo, that was previously uh, set forth by the Obama uh, 
administration, and then recently removed by the Trump administration, which was a, a great thing for, for everybody in the industry because it took a um, a memo that said we're going to we're going to not to deploy federal resources to police these activities uh, to now they have to force and regulate this under uh, Congress and the Senate. So it really makes a big difference. So in 2014, uh, the, the U.S. Treasury Department came out in their federal crimes division called FinCEN came out with guidelines in order to enable financial institutions to navigate the challenging and changing cannabis business with the regulatory compliance waters. It's very, very uh, complex when you think about uh, Bank Secrecy Act, anti-money laundering, and all the other items like SARS reporting, which is suspicious activity uh, reporting, and then also CTRs, which is any transaction that's over $10,000. So even though it's, it's very difficult, it's not impossible because those guidelines did come out in 2014. There are a number of, of banks doing this for uh, various reasons, you know, uh, there's a number of banks who are not doing it for various reasons. I think the reason why they don't do it is because they don't understand the, the regulatory uh, Bank Secrecy Act compliance that has been put forth. And cost is, is another one because it's an unknown of how do I actually follow these guidelines and how much does it cost to be compliant for our customers. And the next one is reputation risk. And I think that's one most fearful, especially just like, you know, the, the name in, in uh, your business, you know, cut, you know, to note that you are in the marijuana space. Well, some folks uh, find that as a nefarious business still, even though it's legalized in so many states today. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we have is more perception than reality, because the reality is you can legally bank this uh, business. We've done it for over over four years. And we've passed multiple OCC, FDIC audits, as well as state audits. And continuing that every quarter, we have to deal with all of our partner banks. See, you read my mind when you said that this is really a matter of perception. And it seems to be sort of a subjective decision on the part of a banker, because I've seen some companies that have cannabis or hemp or some kind of illicit substance in their name um, able to get a bank account back when it was really difficult. Whereas our company, which doesn't even touch the plant at all, couldn't even get a normal bank account because of the name of our company, The Cannabis Reporter. It has the word cannabis in it. And I think it was just a matter of who we were talking to and how educated they were about the topic. But I want to go back to something that you said in the beginning of that, which is that the coal memo was put into place under the Obama administration and reversed just recently, last year, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe it was within the first year of the new administration. And a lot of people perceived that to be more of a negative thing. And I think if I was hearing you correctly, you're saying that by removing the parameters set forth in the coal memorandum, that basically it opened up some doors to make it easier to bank. Is that what I heard you say? Or am I misinterpreting that? Yeah, the, the Cole Memo didn't make it any easier to bank with it or without it. What the Cole Memo did in the first place was to engage with states that wanted to have a cannabis business. So the, the Cole Memo, by being removed, was uh, a great thing, but it did not affect the whether we can bank or not. It really affected the fact that it enabled states in the beginning to, uh, to offer cannabis-related businesses a legal way to transact within those states. With it being removed, it's actually enabled the federal government to go after uh, a very healthy black market that is is really destroying the uh, the above board market. And the above board market is those folks that pay their licensing fees, pay their taxes, engage in all the compliance for 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 Cat three, Cat two testing, whatever state, whatever testing programs they have, where the black market does not have to have any of those guidelines. And it's really been a, um, you know, you look at it where uh, probably most of the folks that, that start in this industry were, were in the black market, gray market, whatever you want to call it, and, and now really transitioned into the above board. Well, in doing so, they're, they're fitting all the requirements and being a legal business under the state and local laws. And that's, that's really uh, affected uh, the, the competition in the business when your competition doesn't have to pay any taxes or fit any compliance or have any other type of handcuffs on it, we'll call, uh, it's very difficult. So the, with the Colt memo being removed, 
it's enabled the federal government to offer uh, funds for local law enforcement to go after those illegal businesses while maintaining the integrity of the legal ones. Because as you know, the, the federal government does like the, the cannabis business and the state does because they get to enjoy a very nice new and, and, and growing tax base. And so how they help those businesses survive is by helping eliminate the black market. And the Cole Memo has really done that. We've seen it, especially in LA, a lot of, lot of local raids that are happening there to take down the illegal uh, businesses that are there just to stop that competition uh, against, uh, again, compliant uh, tax paying entities that are there today. So we feel very strongly that Congress is going to have to make some decisions uh, at a federal level in order to gauge this, you know, from uh, a holistic way to say this is going to be descheduled just like they did with the farm bill and hemp. We feel that's going to happen, you know, maybe in the next two years could be possibly the next five. So whether it's this administration or the next, I feel every administration sees the value of the tax base and understanding that, uh, it's better to, just like the alcohol industry, prohibition didn't work, and that actually created a very healthy, um, you know, mob world that just was, you know, crime. And now they've made it, and Anheuser-Busch and all these other groups, they're compliant. They, they're FDA approved, and they fit all whatever federal guidelines they are. But more importantly, they're contributing to the growth of the country and through taxes and other various ways. So. So really having the ability of the government to manage, monitor, and financially benefit from these businesses is a good thing. And I would, I would say most politicians these days see it that way and don't see it as a gateway drug to heroin or some other awful thing. So. Although there are still a few holdouts, I must say. But, you know, for the most part, yeah, I think you're right. I think that the perception in Congress has changed anyway, dramatically from where it was. And with two houses of Congress being in favor of the hemp bill caught some people by surprise because traditionally on the conservative side of the aisle, there was a lot of opposition to legalizing anything related to cannabis. And it was sort of relegated or perceived to be this sort of liberal issue. <laughs> and of late, I think you're right. They've seen the value in it. They've seen the value in the tax base. They've seen the opportunity that it can provide for revitalizing farming communities and all of that. But what do you make of the fact that they descheduled hemp and they exempted the THC traces that are found in hemp, but they didn't exempt the CBD that is extracted from hemp from Schedule 1, and then they turned the control of CBD over to the FDA from the DEA. And the FDA seems to be flexing its muscles to control the CBD industry. And I'm sure you've seen the memorandum that they sent out a couple of weeks ago stating that they intended to enforce that and that only one CBD company is legal. I mean, it's creating a lot of confusion. What do you make of that from a compliance side of the equation? Well, honestly, I think everyone has to justify their job. And by doing that, you can uh, create havoc that can take a long time. And, and government is known for that of understanding to break down a problem and take it to the 10th degree, which is really not necessary. Uh, we really see the farm bill helping out the direct farmer. And, and really what it does, and, and with, our, with our lending platform for Honor Enterprise funding, we're able to engage in, in more access to capital than we previously were, which is a great thing for those farmers. But you're right, once they become a, a, to extraction and other lab type of uh, operations to either make it dissolute, isolate, or whatever they decide to make it, that end product is, is very confusing. And you're going to see... Uh, a lot of folks transitioning into the hemp and CDB, CBD market. And I believe uh, it's going to be a hundred times bigger or more than what the THC market is. And, and more because of the client base that is willing to ingest CBD compared to THC. You know, and my, my father himself, he would, would never take in THC in any form, but he uh, definitely has been on CBD for, uh, about six months now and feels uh, a huge difference. And the biggest part of that is uh, other um, other pharmaceutical drugs he now is, is being taken off of through his physician 
and, and feeling much better. And he's 77 years old. So you definitely, they, uh, the pharmaceutical world is designed a whole platform in order to keep feeding you uh, various drugs to make you, uh, you know, feel that you need those things every day and you really don't a good diet and exercise and, and a healthy dose of understanding what's, what's right for your body is, is most important. And uh, I, I feel that the market for CBD is really a global piece, especially in emerging countries, you know, and, and call Mexico an emerging country just because you're going to see a lot more uh, holistic ingestion of CBD in that country more than you would from pharmaceutical. So that's always going to be the battle is, is the pharmaceutical companies are going to want to be either big players in the industry, which of course they will be. Well, importantly, they're going to want to drive out those folks that they see as competition. And that's typical business. That's healthy commerce. And we're going to see that continue to grow in, around, the lo- around the globe. Yeah, I agree with you about that. And the CBD industry really is already a runaway train. And considering that it it was legal for more than a decade, I think it was 12 years, that it was legal anywhere in the United States to make, buy, and sell as long as it was coming from imported hemp. So it excluded all the U.S. farmers, of course, which was tragic. But ever since they took CBD out and gave it its own its own scheduled code, there's been this dark cloud of confusion that's you know got people wondering, well, why why would they why would they put it in Schedule One when it was perfectly legal as a supplement, you know, as long as it was made from imported hemp for for more than a decade? But with this memorandum that came out from the FDA, it seems that it would deter farmers from wanting to get into the hemp industry if they felt that their most profitable end product, because we don't have the infrastructure right now to use hemp for everything that it can be used for, all 20 some odd thousand uses of it. It would seem that if if they really are, as they say they are, going to restrict people from making and selling CBD without that FDA approval, then... What's to prevent deterring the farmers from actually transitioning from soy or corn or some other cash crop into hemp? <laughs> it's, it just seems like such a conundrum. What are your thoughts? Yeah, actually, I work closely with a lot of farmers, and uh, we just had an event last night where folks came in from, from Colorado, uh, Northern California, and other places to discuss uh, how we can grow the market. And we work with one company very closely called can goods and can goods is helping build a smarter hemp supply chain and that's understanding that the, the farmer uh the distribution the the processing plants and and the retailers all all are on the same page and how to manage and maintain the integrity of that supply chain so the the products are tested they are processed correctly and able to pass any local federal guidelines that there are there and globally i mean it's really uh, a, a global market that's that's going to be moving along, and sometimes regulations can hurt those farmers in, in a way that it doesn't make sense. Because as a farmer, you should understand what your availability is to a crop. You know, if I plant alfalfa and I get you know ten cents a pound, or if I I plant hemp and I get four dollars a pound, well, the economics are, are greatly different, and the farmer should be able to make that decision. And that was the whole purpose of the farm bill. Now where we can go with more products and that, that will lay on the entrepreneurs, they get more creative. Uh, I know a group that's creating a product to, to rival uh, carbon fiber, which you can use different hemp fibers in order to weave in with the resins to create cars, buildings, anything. I mean, carbon fiber is great and hemp fiber will, will really make a massive change be, because of the, the ability to uh, cycle it so many times uh, through the growing year. So really, it's 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 going to be challenging for a lot of those businesses uh, that you know have to understand there there are a lot of regulations, there are a lot of things you have to navigate. So you have to engage with the right teams in order to understand that, whether it be an advisor or some other legal um, a consultant that can help you move those things along. I, I highly advise everyone that is in in this industry to definitely engage with the proper accountant, lawyer, and more importantly, uh, you know, your team that's going to help you with your finances, software, data science, and, and any other expert that says, be good at what you do, 
and then engage with, with the best of the best. And that's, that's the best advice I can give. Right. So they, they don't have the same ease in entering the market as, say, you know, uh, an alfalfa farmer who decides to start growing corn. It's not like you can just go and plant a new variety of produce. They still have to go through proper channels to do the licensing. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Yeah, you know, and even, even when you're talking about uh, the, the change of crops, Genetics becomes a big play because of the difference between, you know, what levels of THC are going to be in there. And then once you process it and, and it becomes concentrated, uh, that, that's going to change how much of that uh, THC or CBD municipal value is going to be. So that to be very aware of that. So understanding the genetics you deploy and understanding what the difference is between, am I going to go from, you know, alfalfa to corn or if I'm going to go to alfalfa to to hemp, how do I handle that product logistically, you know, from understanding how do, how do I plant it to how do I manage the crop during its life cycle? And then more importantly, how do I harvest it and then store it and then distribute it? Uh, all of those have guidelines that are all very difficult. Uh, and again, engaging with, uh, you know, a, a well-known consultant is going to really help the business out, but it is, it is difficult, but, uh, those that really stick through it and, and manage will be very successful. And, and we've seen it a number of other businesses that are around. It's really interesting that this is going to create a whole new vertical in jobs, it seems, you know, for people who need to be educated about this and people who've worked in and around the cannabis industry for a long time and who understand some of these regulatory pitfalls and loopholes and all of that, they'll be able to move into these jobs. But it sounds as though there's going to be a big need for people to brush up on their regulatory knowledge and assist some of these farmers in working through some of these things. And I know that that's what, that's what you do. I mean, you go from seed to bank, obviously. And do you feel as though in your company with this new law that's passed, do you think that there's going to be a lot of opening for people who know and understand all of this stuff to come and work for companies like yours? Yeah, of course. I mean, there's, there's plenty of opportunity and, and for us to be so blessed to, to engage in this industry, it is amazing. And, and a lot of it is because of the entrepreneurial spirit that everyone that has in this space, it's, it really is great to see. Uh, again, time and time again, I meet the most amazing people and they're looking to do uh, the right thing, meaning follow the compliance, move forward, just run a really good business. And they're doing that uh, for their family. And they're doing it for a lot of reasons. And I can tell you, hemp CBD is, is, a, is a wonder drug that was, was squashed down for a long time, you know, by various entities throughout history and really is coming back and making a resurgence. So it's here to stay. And we just have to band together, continue doing the right thing, following guidelines, following compliance, whether it be from banking, lending, or payment processing, it's really going to make a huge difference on your business. So that's, that's probably one of the biggest things. Again, engage, engage with a qualified expert in those areas. It really is the Wild West, isn't it? I mean, it's been a long time since this country has seen an emerging industry with so much potential to change so many lives, you know, all the way from medical to agriculture and everything in between. It's it's really phenomenal. And <laughs> so, I don't know why I'm thinking of it, but you mentioned something about the element of the black market emerging out of prohibition. And then right after that, you said something about Anheuser-Busch. And I was thinking to myself that the alcohol prohibition was so short-lived compared to this that by the time Congress got around to reversing it and actually adding a constitutional amendment to end prohibition of alcohol, people could remember those martini lunches and champagne New Year's Eve celebrations and were so shocked by the high level of mafia crime and and this whole underground bootleg movement <laughs> that took over the legal alcohol movement, that they were ready to get rid of it. And in this industry, it, it seems that we've endured a war on drugs that has just caused so much damage to our society on so many levels. 
But I, it, it's just so exciting to me, though, to see the regulations sort of relaxing in this direction and all of the opportunity that it's going to provide to people in so many different economic markets. It seems like the sky is the limit. And I think you're right. There's that great entrepreneurial spirit that people bring to this because it is so new. And before you were doing this, what sector of the economic uh, world were you working in before cannabis? Well, you know, we, you, you spoke on this revolution that's happening right now and how unique it is to have a business that can impact so many different areas of everyone's life. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. You know, I was, I was part of, you know, the tech industry after the dot-com boom, and I was fortunate to be part of you know, a, a company that, that I think changed uh, the world from, uh, from an internet perspective and an availability to see what information is out there. I was a uh, part of GoDaddy.com, which is a web hosting domain company, uh, pretty well known based out of Scottsdale, Arizona, here where we live. We're like, you know, I got early in Facebook and Google and all those other companies because nobody really knew who they were, right? Except I was in the industry. And so you knew they were going to be probably good, right? Obviously, yeah. nobody could predict where Google and Facebook went for sure. But but I, I have a, a bunch of those in my portfolio. It makes a big, big difference on when you see this because you get this inside knack and as, as these industries grow, it's really amazing. You know, crypto had that same investor mentality. I think that kind of got busted, especially with Bitcoin. You know, two, two greatest things that ever happened in my crypto business was Bitcoin going up to almost 20,000. And the second best thing was it going down to now around 3,000, right? So seeing right. that fluctuation drives, uh, you know, awareness where you're like, I'm not sure if that's the right thing I should do. And that's where I go, just asset back tokens. And, and really being part of that, that revolution. And that was something that we had the dot com boom and then, and then bust. And really what happened out of that was a company like GoDaddy and a few others I've been part of made it made such a huge impact in everybody's lives that you, you don't even realize today what what it really took to get to there and it took some uh some pioneers and entrepreneurs to take chances uh take on investment uh take on failures and that's and that's really what what moves business along and so i've been fortunate enough to be part of i, I believe that revolution which which impacted and still does everyday life today uh to to the to the cannabis space whether it be thc or cbd where you've got these folks that are really coming in to make a huge, huge impact, you know, in, in a way where people are seeing it in a different light as a medicine and a treatment for so many different areas of our lives that it, it's, it's, a, it's amazing. And, and we're also part of the other financial revolution, which is blockchain. So we have a, a blockchain company called C2. That, that company is, is doing some amazing things for the financial industry in a compliant way without creating uh, havoc, which was the idea behind uh, Bitcoin, which was to, you know, not utilize financial systems like banks or, or government regulated entities. We actually embrace that, that regulation in those banks because we're, we feel that the banks and, and government regulation is, is a good thing as long as you can follow and, and file with, within those guidelines. So with cannabis being here and moving forward and blockchain, uh, again, I'm I'm so blessed to be part of these industries and and to help people be successful. You know, from you know what we do is we help them, uh, you know, increase their safety by banking their cash, uh, which right now cash everyone thinks is a great thing. But I can tell you, if you talk to anybody in the industry, uh, if if they don't have a bank account or have cash issues, the cost of of managing that cash, the security, uh, is is really could be. Uh, life-threatening in a lot of ways if you're carrying around, you know, fifty thousand dollars or millions of dollars, right? So it's it's very difficult. It's costly, and more importantly, you know, there's there's many generations deep that I've spoken with, you know, two three generations that never had a bank account in this industry, and so you have to teach them now what compounding interest is and what other financial services are, so that they can do investments and move that forward. So a lot of that is the education process that we do. And it's, it's really enjoyable to see uh, the effect it has on, on folks that just didn't have this access to capital or financial solutions. And uh, you know, even five years ago, wasn't available to anybody, you know, in a legal way. So 
now it's here, it's here to stay, and it's only going to get better. Yeah. Well, let me just go back to what you were saying. I mean, it is transforming lives, and that is exciting for sure. But I wanted to ask you also about the blockchain because – I've heard mixed reviews about where the blockchain industry is going, and I know it's been very useful for the cannabis industry. Do you think that there's still a lot of potential in that market, not just related to cannabis, but to other industries? Yeah, 100%. I, I feel blockchain is, is really doing some amazing things. And really, at the end of the day, what blockchain is, it's a, a database that can store a lot of information in a small package while maintaining the integrity of the continuity of data that's in there. So if there's any alterations and changes in data, that that will create a new hash, which will then show that that data was changed. And so you'd be able to look back and find out who did it, why did it happen, and what was changed, which you typically don't have that type of access. And we use blockchain for the cannabis industry as part of our compliance because we do background checks on every principal of the companies. We do licensing checks every month. And we connect into all the seed to sale systems or POS systems to get that cannabis related, legal cannabis related transaction data. So that's a lot of information that we take in uh, every day from every transaction. And we apply that to those deposits. And that's why we're so successful at what we do is because we're able to then go back to regulators when they come to us and go, where do these transactions derived? Who do they come from? Who, who's all the players in the industry in the transaction here? Uh, are they good standing citizens? Yep, here's their background checks. Are they licensed and legal? Yes, here's all their licenses. And and what exactly did they buy? A 1042. Mark Denzen bought uh, you know two ways of flour at this price, paid cash, and moved that in the system. So blockchain is really making a huge difference for uh, retaining that data and maintaining the integrity of it. Now for other industries, it allows the same information to be changed. So Bitcoin, the value of a Bitcoin or uh, other cryptocurrencies is really based on scarcity. There's only so many Bitcoins that have ever been produced. And so people want them more and that's why they'll pay more or they want them less and that's why they'll pay less. And, and that drives values up and down. What I see and what I work on with, with another one of my companies called Open Network, but what we do there is is very simply go through and we do asset backed tokens. So the value of the token isn't based on a hope and a prayer that people want it and they'll pick it up or we're raising money to do other things, which is typically what an ICO is, which is an initial coin offering. What we do is we take an asset like gold, real estate, energy, all those things have, have an inherent value core to it. And so if you attach that value it makes a significant difference, which, which the SEC that regulates um, uh, cryptocurrencies today for the United States sees that as utility tokens and, and not as an ICO. So even though there's securities, it's just like buying a stock into a, a piece of real estate or uh, you know, a portion of energy that you transact in that has a cap rate or an IRR or some value that goes up and down. So you can actually have a whole portfolio of traditional investments, but using uh, blockchain in order to maintain and retain ownership of it and the integrity of, of how much the value is based on that particular asset. And I think it's probably one of the most amazing things that's, that's happening today. And that really moves things along. And uh, you know, to, to go back to the, uh, the hemp bill, or the farm bill, farm bill pertaining to hemp, it's very difficult to move $5 million or $10 million or $20 million from, from one bank to one transaction to another without having a lot of information behind it, uh, regardless if it's unregulated or regulated business. And so blockchain would be able to help move those transactions along without having to uh, circumvent or make a workaround uh, uh, from, from guidelines. You actually follow the guidelines, but without the restrictions of traditional uh, banking that happens with that. So I see, I see a huge impact. So thank you for explaining that because I really had no idea that there was a difference between the um, value backed cryptocurrency that's backed by something of value like, you know, gold, as you say. So uh, I really did not know that there was such a thing. 
and that there was a way to distinguish that. So that's interesting. Thank you. And the other thing, too, it almost sounds like the mechanism that was made possible by the internet when it comes to like intra banking transactions, it would be impossible for Wells Fargo in a wire transfer to take a, a semi truck to deliver a million dollars to a specific transaction. And it's all handled online these days, correct? So is it is it a similar concept to that? It really is. So think of blockchain as you know, if you ever had to ACH, which is automated clearing house, or you write a check, uh, or you use a wire, which is the two typical forms of transferring money from one place to another. If you ever try to do either one, you go to your bank, you tell them what bank account they want, you want that money to go to, and they will ship that over there. But they only allow you a couple lines of information. So you can go, okay, Mark Tenzin is buying 100 pounds of flour, and that's about all you can fit in there, right? And then when, when you get audited, you're, not, you're going to see, okay, you bought 100 pounds of flour. Well, who is Mark Denzen? Is, is he uh, a licensed regulated guy? Is he following all the anti-money laundering laws? Is he doing all these things? And there's no way to tell that from a traditional ACH or wire. So blockchain will actually continue to grow and help these banks meet and exceed current, current day compliance that's set forth. And that's really going to change the market quite a bit because we're already regulated to, to provide all this information uh, on, a, on a daily minute basis. So why wouldn't we retain that within our financial transactions to hold the integrity of that uh, legal cannabis business that's there? And that's really a, a game changer as, as it moves forward. So when people do, we work with a lot of platforms. Uh, so our blockchain and our back end are used uh, almost eight platforms we're working with today and many more uh, coming up. And what those platforms do is they trade uh, from a B2B perspective, uh, products from the farm to the distributor, to the labs, to the retailers. And how do they do that? And how do they do that in a way where they have uh, understanding all the, the product is compliant from a testing perspective. And then more importantly, right now, a lot of these platforms are just going, okay, you can sell your, 10 pounds or hundred pounds of flour or trim or whatever it may be. And then, you know, you ask those guys like, okay, how do I pay for it? Well, when they show up, you're going to give them your, your million dollars of cash or hundred thousand dollars of cash, whatever the value is. And then they're going to take in that cash. And now they've got to move that cash, which in any other business, you don't have to do that. So you don't have that risk or that cost of transporting that value. So we work very closely with these platforms in order to maintain and retain again, the integrity of the information that's being passed along so we can meet and exceed guidelines that put forth by our government. Right. Well, I, the, it's very interesting. And I, I was thinking about, oh, like four or five years ago when Sanjay Kupta came out with Weed, the series on CNN, and there was just one dispensary that he was following on this particular episode and they were talking about the hassle of having to hire an armored truck to come and take one and a half million dollars out to drive it, physically drive it to the IRS. <laughs> and it occurred to me just how dangerous that was to have to do that. It, it's astonishing to me that ever since this began, that when the states started regulating cannabis, that they didn't set in place some sort of bypass to this. You know, and I don't think they could because of the federal law. It's just really interesting. But yeah, I'm, I appreciate learning about the cryptocurrency and how all of that works. And it really does seem like a fascinating industry for people to be in at this time. And are the restrictions from the SEC similar to regular securities when it comes to blockchain? Yeah, actually, it's even it's even more scrutinized because of uh, what happened over the last few years. There were some bad individuals that utilized this as a platform to do uh, financial crimes. Basically, they're defrauding the investors and taking the money and calling it blockchain and with no intention of ever fulfilling whatever they said. And that's where asset-backed tokens and other pieces of of cryptocurrencies or blockchain is utilized for uh, good that you can see it, you can feel it, you can touch it, where if it's an ICO, which, which right now the uh, ICOs are slowed to a halt 
to a point where I don't think I see too many moving forward. You know, Wyoming try to be at the forefront of crypto world and blockchain here, which is kind of, you know, some people might find it surprising, but, but Wyoming is very progressive with their, with their business laws and their banking laws. So it was a, it was a natural fit for them. Although even, even then with, with all that backing of, of so many folks in, in the U S it still has a hard time moving forward. So, you know, as you see the impact that uh, you're going to see from, you know, again, regulatory compliance that is just monitored and maintained, when there's fraud involved, you're always going to have a higher level of investigations. You're going to have a higher level of scrutiny. And, and that's really good for, for everybody in a sense where protection is the number one. It's not good for, for ingesting and creating, you know, do things so those entrepreneurs are held back due to those compliant legal entrepreneurs are held back by what we call bad actors. You know, people that are just doing nefarious business without any resolve other than um, they're bad people, in my opinion. Uh, and I and I, I applaud the government for what it does, but it really hurts us in the in the legal market. Yeah, no doubt it would. And how does it work? Let's say someone when they subscribe to the cryptocurrency to conduct their business, how does that work in the international market? Is there the ability to go from crypto to hard money bank and vice versa? Yes, uh, 100% there is. And one of our companies, uh, U.S. Gold, which has been around since 1980, doing gold transactions with the U.S. Double Eagle, which is a one-ounce coin that is considered uh, the only currency from a gold perspective uh, in this country. So it's really amazing to see what we do from that perspective. So our, our token called the USG is, is where it's listed and, and various exchanges allows you to buy the gold token at the federal government uh, rate, which is not spot price. Spot price fluctuates on a daily second minute basis where the federal government created a price determination to help with the deficit. Okay. So what we're doing is, is we're applying the gold standard that was taken away in 1971 by Richard Nixon and reapplying it to our financial transactions. So gold's gold in any country that you go to, it's always going to have that value. So if I buy a gold token with US dollars in the United States and I sell those to Colombia, which is a, which is a very, very strong hemp market, uh, they're a great country that's a big exporter, uh, various different countries, but again, has a hard time moving money in and out just because of, you know, the old cocaine days where Colombia was it, you know, I mean, everybody thinks Pablo Escobar and Colombia, what do you think of, uh, you know, Colombia and that whole market there, which really now it's emerged as a huge hemp market, but their biggest problem is how do I, how do I get paid for my product and how do I pay for, for product? And so what we utilize is that gold transaction. So, you know, when you buy it, it's, it is what it's worth. And, and when you sell it, meaning you give it to someone else, that they have that same value and can redeem it in whatever country that they're in. So it's very exciting to see there's only a handful of countries that we can't do business in just because that's what the uh, various governments decided that, uh, you know, those, those countries are, you know. So it seems as though applying the gold standard is going to make the currency, the cryptocurrency more stable, obviously, than than even just uh, regular currency, you know, and dealing with the exchange rates and all of that. I mean, the gold is going to have a steady value across whatever currency they're dealing in. So it seems like it's going to be even more stable than just dealing in cash or or, you know, conventional transactions, banking transactions. Am I right about that? We're a, firm, we're a firm believer in that. I mean, it's really amazing to see a group like ours bring back that gold standard to the ability to transmit value from one person to another, one entity to another. I mean, gold obviously has been used as currency and value for thousands of years and will continue with that same value uh, to all of us that are involved in, in increasing value and decreasing value goes to speculators. But at the end of the day, you're not going to see a huge fluctuation in, in price points, and there's always going to be a need for it. As long as it's asset-backed, 
and you're able to show that value and create that movement, you know, gold is heavy. Logistically, it's hard, you know, and, and gold in these transactions, the two things, logistics and math. Does the math work and what are the logistics? If I've got to move a million dollars of gold or I can digitally move a million dollars of value, well, that's, that significantly reduces cost and efficiency for every transaction. And that's what really commerce is about, is figuring out how do I reduce my expenses and increase my capability to transact on a, on a higher basis. And that's what we offer. Wow. Okay, so this might sound like a very ignorant question, and forgive me if it is, but if someone has X number of dollars in value of the cryptocurrency that you deal in, and they decide to cash it in for their gold, can they go to a vault and pick it up? <laughs> yeah, 100%. 100% they can. We have uh, vault stores that, is, is again, it's a, it's a one-to-one token, right? So to issue a token, we have to have that gold piece within our, our own vaults. And that's, and that's very important to understand, and that's what's regulated from the government. It's insured, and we're able to move that forward. So, so you go, you call me up, and you go, Mark, and it's, I'm just making it easy. Say, call me up, and say, Mark, I, I want to sell my gold token, but I want to retain the gold coin itself. Could you ship it to me? And the answer is yes, of course we can do that. And then we'd work out how that would be again logistically. Uh, and that's and that's very simple. We do a lot of gold transactions and people buy and sell gold all the time, but they typically don't want to retain it uh, in their own possession or pay to have it stored. So they'll pay us to store their gold uh, assets. And that's something where you can do. So yes, you can come by any time and uh, trade trade your, your value for, for actual metal. So go from digital or paper to digital to metal and vice versa. Is That's exactly what we do. Down to the penny or rounded up to the closest ounce of gold? Uh, it's So uh, if you ever seen a U.S. double eagle, it's a one ounce gold coin that the federal treasury creates. And that's what the value is. So it's we don't weigh out gold or whatever. It's the value of that ounce of gold based on the strike rate of the by the federal treasury department. Right. This is really fascinating and something I know very little about. But it it, it sort of makes sense for the cannabis industry because it's giving it a lot more credence than any other in God we trust, <laughs> taking the risk that there might be bad actors out there. And this is a green rush akin to a gold rush in a way. So it completely makes sense to me. And um, I'm glad you're able to explain that because it's been a mystery to me. And I know quite a bit about cannabis, but very little about about the financial side of it. So it is fascinating. And, you know, there's definitely a learning curve, I think, for people who get involved on that level. And what would you what would you advise people to do to start out transacting this way and entering this business from a financial perspective? What would be your advice? Well, most folks will start in this business and and they'll have uh, partners or some form of investment through either equity or if they have access to debt or some type of equipment leasing in order to grow or start that business. And uh, if you've ever started a business, you know equity is more expensive than debt any day. So as a business owner and entrepreneur, I want to give up the least amount of equity, which is the ownership of the company that that is created, uh, and be able to use what term is other people's money, which is debt or equipment leasing, monies in order to make that happen. And that every industry in this country uh, leverages debt and, and be able to, to perform activities that they typically wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do. And, and one form is growing their business, managing, maintaining the integrity of their cash supply when being able to move that forward. So speaking with you know, a group like ours and on our enterprise funding, we're able to help educate you and understand of what are your options. Uh, we, do, we do equity investment as well as, as debt and finance leasing, although we'll talk to you and find out what's gonna be the best solution for your company. You know, and, that's, and that's really something where I tell people all the time, consult an expert. If, 
if you don't talk to a group like ours, then find someone that, that is locally there. I mean, obviously, we'd love to talk to you and we can talk about very various topics from your banking solution to your payment processing to lending and other pieces like payroll or insurance, which is extremely important for this industry as well. And we talked a little bit earlier in the conversation where, uh, you know, these, these banks and you said, you said, you know, we, we had a hard time, but we've got one and, and here it is. I, I work with a payroll company and they have a traditional payroll company and they decided to get in the cannabis space. Well, because they had such a large traditional payroll company, their bank said, okay, we'll allow your cannabis related business to, to uh, work within our financial system. But, you know, we may or may not like it, but we're going to let you do it because we want to keep you as a customer. Well, I got a call the other day uh, and it was, it was, it was good and bad. And that's what he says. He goes, Mark, I got good news and bad news. I'm like, well, what's the good news? He goes, the good news is uh, I'm opening up bank accounts with you and we're going to start right away. I already sent you the application so we can start the process. I said, that's fantastic. I, you know, I always love the, the business. And, uh, and I go, what's the bad news? He goes, well, we had all our bank accounts shut down uh, because we received a couple wires from our clients for payroll pr- purposes that had cannabis related um, names and the bank did an audit and didn't like it. And they shut down all of our bank accounts. So now my personal accounts and everything else, I've got 30 days to, to move those monies. So I really need your help. And, and, uh, you know, he literally was telling me just, just a few months ago on how he's good with his banking because he, his legitimate business and his banker relationship are so good. So those things can change any day. So having a, uh, above board compliant, uh, revealed canvas related business bank account is very, very important. So you're not waiting one day or another going, God, I hope I don't get shut down. Uh, that would be terrible. And if it was an online CBD business, which we deal with, you can't have credit card processing account without a bank account. So if you lose your bank account, you're no longer able to transact your credit card transactions. And if that's your only form of income for your business, it could take up to 30 days or more to get a new bank account in place for your business. So most businesses, if they are not able to transact and produce revenue for 30 days, or, or more, they're more likely going to be going out of business and, and having a hard time. So really, when we see the industry change and, and evolve, you know, having that fully compliant uh, canvas rated business bank account is an important way to go. And so again, consult the experts. You can talk to me anytime. You can find me. Uh, you know, I travel the whole country speaking at events and understanding that education on this is is the first form of, of helping these businesses be successful. And that's really ultimately my goal. Well, that's the reason we're here. <laughs> Education is key. It really is. And that kind of ambiguity is really scary, I think. And, you know, like your new client coming in and saying that this just happened after having permissions from the bank to go ahead and do the business that they're doing. It's, it's very scary, I think, for some. I mean, do you think that once regulation takes effect for the whole plant, like once they they legalize it, bring it out into the realm of, let's say, the kind of regulation that's applied to alcohol industry or or the tobacco industry, do you think that a lot of the services that you're providing now, do you think that those will still be relevant when that happens? Yeah, I get that question all the time, actually, from our banking compliance company, Integrated Compliance Solutions, that's really out there helping those banks follow the guidelines for a essentially a federally illegal business that is essentially unregulated from, from that level. Okay. So we'll go, well, when it becomes uh, schedule one to a two, three, five, six, whatever it may be, uh, that is really significant when it comes down to it, people like, well, then everybody's going to be able to bank and transact and do whatever they want. And, and that, that's actually the opposite. What's going to happen is when it gets descheduled from an illegal drug to a legal drug, that's when regulations will kick in and get even greater than they would if it as a, because you don't have to make regulations to do something for an illegal drug because it's illegal. So you just, it's black and white. But once it becomes a, a fully regulated compliant, uh, product that's out there on a, on a federal level, there's going to be a higher level of compliance on a lower one. Now there'll be more folks that are getting into it, so it drives the cost down, 
for for what it is because that's just the nature uh, again of competition. Although I think it's going to be really good. So I don't see within the next three to five years you're going to see a significant change in where that is unless Congress and the Senate decide to get off their butts and and make some some real hard decisions and and move forward with this and do the right thing for not not only for their communities from a tax base perspective but more importantly from people from a health benefit perspective. Yeah. Well, I would think that the high level of organization that it takes to do what you're doing for these companies would be really useful in a fully regulated market as well. And I talked about this a few weeks ago, that the cannabis industry has had to comply with so many different rules and regulations and jump over regulatory barriers to the point where the industry itself is self-monitoring, if you will, and and they've had to pay special attention to certain details that other legal markets don't have to even think about, really. And I would think that that level of organization and that level of conscientious attention to detail would continue to be very useful even after it's legalized. And what are your thoughts? Yeah, just just talk to any accountant or attorney that deals with any other industry it's very important to understand what, what the rules and regulations are, whether you're a, a builder for construction or an energy company, or whatever you may be, it's, it's always going to be number one to consult the, the best of the best in order to ensure the success of your business. And more importantly, uh, maintaining your family's uh, well-being. And that's really why we work so hard and do everything we do. And our families include our immediate family. And then also, you know, our, our surrounding network that we have to ensure that, you know, everybody around us is, lives a good life and it's successful, whatever that may mean for them. Well, it's exciting. And I feel like I've learned a lot today. And I have to say thank you for that. So I am getting a signal that it's time for us to start wrapping it up. Any last thoughts? Yeah, I really appreciate having our show. And, and you had some great questions to understand. What, what is out there and it can be very confusing. So definitely reach out to me or my team and we'll have my information out there for them. Love to talk to you, educate you, help you understand if you choose one of our companies to go with, fantastic. If you don't, make sure you choose somebody that is compliance first and, and moves forward to protect your business and your interests. And you know, don't try to navigate this and guess because there's folks out there that like us that have already navigated it. We follow and we follow and manage and maintain the guidelines that are set forth by our government. And that's most important for everybody to understand. Words to the wise, Mark. Words to the wise. <laughs> well, I so appreciate you being on the show today. And I also appreciate your support of our efforts to educate the public about cannabis and you know it's just such an exciting time to be in this industry and there's there's a huge learning curve as I've said and having people on who are as knowledgeable about these things as you are is I think really helpful to raising the awareness and fostering the acceptance that we need to keep moving this industry forward so thank you again you're welcome I really appreciate having me on the show my pleasure. So once again, it is time to bring yet another show to a close. If you would like to learn more about the work that Mark Denson is doing, please visit us online at thecannabisreporter.com. Click podcast to find today's episode. And that's where you'll find his bio along with information and links to his website. We have so many people to thank. First, I'd like to express our gratitude for our radio partners, Sun State Technology, Canisphere Biotech, and Integrated Compliance Solutions for supporting our show. I'd also like to thank my production team here at The Cannabis Reporter for making us shine and our programming directors at XRQK Radio Network and Society Bites Radio for distributing our show. And last but not least, thanks to all of you for listening. I'm Snowden Bishop inviting you to join me next week same time, same place for another episode of the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show. 
Until we meet again, we encourage you to give what you can, stay safe and informed, share what you've learned, and make it a great day.